found out something really interesting. Um, yesterday, my oldest sister, uh, she had a bunch of old newspaper articles and things um, about, you know, from my grandparents on my father's side. And she was going through some, um, some of these and she found this old newspaper article about my, my great grandfather's farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And uh, very interesting here. I'm going to show you this email. I'm going to be blocking certain parts of it out to protect private email addresses and things like this. But um, she sent it to my mother. My mother, mother sent it to me. British Embassy Attaché buys 87-acre farm here. This article, whoever wrote it, didn't do a very great job. It says David Agilvy. It's Ogilvy with an O, not an A of the British Embassy staff, Washington, D.C., bought a Lancaster County farm at public sale on Wednesday afternoon, paying 257 an acre for the farm of 81 acres of land in Salisbury Township, which was offered at public auction by um, D.W. Denlinger of Gap. Okay, uh, it's funny, it says 81 acres here, 87 acres there. Okay, <laughs> it says here, the premises contain substantial um, farm buildings equipped with electricity, Kind of shows you how far back this one goes. Um, shedding to hang 10 acres of tobacco, meadow, running water, and 8 acres of woodland on Gap Hill. Eli Byler bid in the place for Ogilvy, I'll say it the right way, who could not attend the sale in person, but who made a number of visits to this county uh, starting early last summer in several attempts to buy a farm in Lake Hawk Township at private sale, according to V.D. Kling, the auctioneer. In a telephone conversation with Ogilvy Wednesday, the auctioneer said the purchaser plans to move to the farm, and in his trips here, he always expressed a desire to live in the heart of Lancaster County among the Amish people, Mr. Kling reported. Very interesting. And so I was like, okay, David Ogilvy. I'm not sure who that is. David uh, Denlinger, I can't remember what the W stood for, but David Dan Denlinger is my great-grandfather. Um, very odd, these connections. So I'm like, David Ogilvy. Okay, who's this guy? Looked it up. Um, you can read this for yourself here. Let me zoom in a little bit here so you can see a little bit better. Uh, writing is a little bit small, but there he is right here. Uh, this David Ogilvy guy. Um, get on here. Coming to America. 1938, Ogilvy emigrated to the United States where he went to work for George Gallup's Audience Research Institute in New Jersey. Ogilvy cites Gallup as one of the major influences on his thinking, emphasizing meticulous research methods and adherence, adherence to reality. During World War II, Ogilvy worked with the intelligence service at the British Embassy in Washington. There he wrote enormously, ana analyzing and making recommendations on matters of diplomacy and security. He extrapol extrapolated his knowledge of human behavior from consumerism to nationalism in a report was suggest, which suggested applying the Gallup technique to fields of secret intelligence. Eisenhower's Psychological Warfare Board picked up the report and successfully put Ogilvy's suggestions to work in Europe during the last year of the war, one of the grandfathers, basically, of psychological warfare used by the military. Now, here it is. After the war, Ogilvy bought a farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and lived among the Amish. The atmosphere of serenity, abundance, and contentment kept Ogilvy and his wife in Pennsylvania for several years, but eventually he admitted his limitations as a farmer and moved to New York. Okay, I guess that's him there on his farm. You know, and here he is again, uh, ad man, big advertising guy here and whatever else. You know, through here he is as an older man. Uh, there's actually, I just, a little while ago, I saw a, um, I shouldn't say a little while ago, this morning I was watching different things and stuff, doing a little bit of research into this guy, and there was an old interview that he did with David Letterman. Okay, I'm not recommending David Letterman show or watching television, but what I'm saying is, you know, he was very, very famous. But his connections to the intelligence field. Um, there's a, here's the Wikipedia article on it, and this is rather telling, I thought. It goes down into here. It's a lot of the stuff from his actual you know, davidogilvy.com, but uh, you go down into here, let's see where the thing is, um, okay, I went past it, I guess, but it, it talks about, uh, yeah, right here, 
Um, also, during World War II, David Ogilvy was a notable alumnus of the Secret Camp X, located near the towns of Whitby and Oshawa in Ontario, Canada. Um, according to an article on the, then there, it was there he mastered the power of propaganda before becoming king of Madison Avenue. Although Ogilvy was trained in sabotage and close combat, he was ultimately tasked with projects that included successfully ruining the reputation of businessmen who were supplying the Nazis with industrial materials. Psychological warfare, you know, some of that stuff there. Military intelligence. He was a spook, in other words. And uh, here is the article on Camp X um, here on Wikipedia. Very interesting things there. And I thought this was interesting down here. Um, where is it at? I'm just kind of scanning the article here. You know, I mean, it's some really interesting stuff here about this camp thing. Um, Basically, it was where the, you know, William Donovan was another one of the ones that went to this Camp X. William Wild Bill Donovan I was a Roman Catholic, and he uh, founded the CIA, the Office of St Strategic Service Services right there. You can see it, and then it became the CIA. Um, you know, so, yeah, right there. Okay, the most notable individual in the camp's history was Colonel William Wild Bill Donovan, wartime head of the OSS, who credited... Sir William Stevenson was teaching Americans about foreign intelligence gathering. Um, so, yeah, very interesting stuff. And I haven't even looked into this whole Camp X thing, but there's a lot of mind control stuff, a lot of military intelligence. They basically got rid of the whole thing, and now there's just a memorial there. Um, some real weird stuff. But then I thought this was interesting. Uh, Ogilvy, the name Ogilvy in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says here, Ogilvy, um, John, English, Jesuit, <laughs> I'm just like, of course, was born in Scotland and educated mainly in Germany, where he entered the Society of Jesus, being ordained priest at Paris in 1613. As an emissary of the Society, he returned to Scotland in this year dis disguised as a soldier. Hmm. And in October 1614, he was arrested in Glasgow. He defended himself stoutly when he was tried in Edinburgh, but he was condemned to death and was hanged on the 28th of February, 1615. Well, praise the Lord for that. But just kind of an interesting thing there. So uh, David Ogilvy, his, one of his ancestors, you go back far enough, and uh, it was a, you know, this guy ended up, you know, being a, a Jesuit. And of course, I mean, obviously Jesuits don't have children, but you understand one of the, you know, it would have been like a great, great, great uncle or something like that. But uh, it goes down through there. Again, different Ogilvies were in um, different situations there. Uh, you know, another one of the Ogilvies um, says, serving with the Scots against Cromwell, he became a prisoner for the third time in 1651. Over here in this passage, it says, Sir George Ogilvy of Barris defended Dunatar Castle against Cromwell in 1651 and 1652 and was instrumental in preventing the regalia of Scotland from falling into his hands, into Cromwell's hands. In 1660, he was created a baronet. The title became extinct in 1837. So, um, just thought that was interesting. You had a, a Jesuit in Ogilvy's family line going back, and also a guy that fought, a Roman Catholic commander, that fought against Oliver Cromwell. So, just kind of inter an interesting thing there to... Um, Really interesting information about this man. And uh, just, you know, it's just kind of odd. I mean, you know, and there's nothing there. I mean, special or whatever else that my great-grandfather was somehow in on things or whatever else. My great-grandfather was a farmer, okay, um, just a common common man. Uh, he died, if I remember correctly, it was, I think he was in his, uh, he was fairly young, if I think. I don't know, I'm thinking actually of my mother's side. I think he died... My great grandfather David Dan Denlinger. My uncle was named after him. Um, so my uncle's name was David Denlinger, and um, but he died, I think, in his 70s or something like that. Um, my dad, I never met my great grandfather, but my dad said he remembered going there, and and uh, you know, his grandfather 
um, was like bedridden for a while and things like that. But my, my great grandmother, my David's um, wife, she was uh, six foot three. So that's my height, and I'm I'm six foot three. So you know I'm like the tallest one of my whole family, and and all even all my cousins and everything, none of them are over six foot tall. So everybody you know always says, well you got that from your great grandmother. So I got my height from my great grandma. It's kind of funny, but um, I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing there. You know, just just weird how things just tie together and whatever else. This this uh, very high level marketing guy and military intelligence, you know, from guy from you know the British government and things like that, and, and tie-ins with the CIA and everything else. And the guy bought my great grandfather's farm. I'm going like, <laughs> this is really weird. So I just thought I'd share that with with everybody out there. Just as kind of an odd thing. You know, it's like the, what do they say? The real world is stranger than fiction. Very true. So that's going to be it. Thanks for watching.